afternoon, it's chapter 30. I have about six Wednesday nights left. So the goal is, is we, have, we need to cover two chapters a night, okay? And so that's my plan for tonight, and uh, we'll get to that in, in a moment. Um, so let's talk about some of the announcements here real quick. Um, I talked with Pastor Bill Baker uh, yesterday, and I think it was today that their house was going up for sale. So we want to keep uh, Pastor Bill and his family in prayer that uh, everything uh, works and goes well there. Join me on Thursday nights as we continue to pray um, for uh, uh, Pastor Bill and his family in that transition, as well as other needs uh, in our church and around the world. I hope that you've um, engaged or been a part of the Pray for America campaign for 30 days. The flyers are on your, on your table. Take one home with you that's got the dates and all that especially, and the things to be praying for. Um, today we're praying for leaders and those in authority uh, that they'll know Christ and make decisions based on the Lord's leading. Many of you are aware that uh, Steve Martinez, you may know Steve by his mom, uh, Dora Montez, who is Joe and Dora are usually at the lobby door helping us out as greeters. Uh, their son, uh, Steve, suddenly passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so the funeral is this Saturday, and it's at 11 o'clock, but if you'd like to provide some food for the meal that will be happening after the service, uh, Saturday starting at 9 a.m., somebody will be here to receive the food. And if you need more information, you can contact Marianne. If you don't have her number, uh, see me afterwards. Um, and uh, just to keep you up to date, uh, Wednesday night, the kids are in Bible Basics, the books of the Bible. They've also been practicing. They have a song that they're going to be sharing and some stuff they're sharing this coming Sunday. Because as everybody knows, this coming Sunday is what? Father's Day. And so... Um, I hope that if your father is still around, that you'll have an opportunity to express your love and your thanks to him. And um, so we'll be celebrating dads this Sunday. We've got a special gift for every dad that will be with us. And then Sunday, Sunday school, um, the Sunday school lesson for the kids is Jesus forgives, uh, Joseph forgives his brothers. So anyway, uh, that's some of that stuff. You can check out more of the announcements. Check out our Facebook page for, for more information. If you're online, you can check it out there as well. Um, if you would, let's go to Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. While you're turning there, uh, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful. We are grateful. We are blessed, oh God, by all that you have done for us. And uh, we are so, so thankful for your word that we can study, that we don't have to guess, oh God, that we can know who you are and what you're like. And uh, Lord, uh, have direction for our lives. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the word of God. And I pray, Lord, tonight that you would quicken me and that you would quicken this word to each one of our hearts. Lord, help me to rightly uh, teach the word, and Lord, may each of us glean what we need from the word of God tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in Exodus chapter 30. The slide up here shows you um, five different topics that are in Ac Exodus chapter 30. We're going to go and look at each one of them, but the five things in this, this 30th chapter are, is there is the um, instructions and directions about the incense altar. Now, there are other altars that we've already looked at, right? There's um, the, the uh, burnt offering um, altar. But uh, this is an incense altar, and it's different from the others. Then there's also discussion about money for the tabernacle. 
Then there's uh, a little bit of direction and discussion on the making of the wash basin. And then um, anointing oil that was used in worship is also spoken of in the 30th chapter. And then finally, there is also incense, and the incense is burnt, obviously, on the incense altar. All right, well, let's take a look at this. The first 10 verses are really all about the altar of incense. And um, the altar of incense these 10 verses can be divided into about three different sections. Verses 1 through 5 talk about the instructions for the construction of this altar of incense. And then verse 6 tells them where to place the altar of incense in the tabernacle. And then verses 7 through 10 tell about the proper usage of this altar of incense. I'd like to show you an artist uh, rendition, an artist drawing. Uh, this is what the, the artist got from the directions that are there. I think that there's some literary license that's going on there. We, don't, we know that there's a crown around the top of it. We know that there are horns that are on it, according to the scriptures we're going to read in a minute. We also know that there were... Um, places for the staves, some rings for the poles to go through for the carrying of it. And I point this out to you and let you know this is an artist's rendition. I'm not telling you this is exactly how it looked because the places where the staves, for instance, the places where the staves or the poles went, it could be a ring that was attached just at one point that it went through it. So the artist is looking at it, and then those panels that are there, there's nothing in the directions that tell us about that, but an artist's rendition of what it possibly looked like. Dimensions we know for sure. The top of it we know for sure. The poles we know for sure. Well, let's take a look at the scripture text together. And um, if I could have... Someone to read for me, please. How about verses um, 1 through 6? They're up here on the, uh, the monitor. If you want to use your Bible, your translation, that's fine too. But let's read verses 1 through 6. Volunteer, please. Okay. All right, and then somebody pick up with verses 7 through 10, please. must burn fragrant incense on the altar. And each evening when he lights the lamps, he must again burn incense in the Lord's presence. This must be done from generation to generation. Do not offer any unholy incense on this altar, or any burnt offerings, grain offerings, or liquid offerings. Once a year, Aaron must purify the altar by smearing its horns with blood from the offering made to purify the people from their sin. This will be a regular, a regular annual event from generation to generation, for this is the Lord's most holy altar. All right, so um, we know from the scripture that 
only one thing was to be all offered on this altar. And what was that one thing offered on it? Incense. Yeah. And it makes real clear, you know, no burnt offerings, no grain offerings, no liquid offerings. It's just incense. That's the only thing that, that's to be offered on it. Um, We'll get to this a little bit more, too. Uh, the incense is very, very unique and very special. Um, its uh, components were clearly detailed in the scripture and um, there to compose it and to make this fragrant, fragrant incense. So somebody pointed out, one of the commentators, that what kind is kind of odd is that other furniture were described and talked about in the holy place before this, chapters before this, right? We have the Ark of the Covenant before this. We have the, uh, the lampstand that's there. What else is in that room? The table of showbread. All that furniture is talked about, and then this is left out when it's talking about everything that's there. And so... There's some head scratching that goes on there. Why wasn't it mentioned? Um, you know, others talked about, well, there wasn't any need of it uh, until after the ordination of the priest to offer the incense. But um, anyway, it, it's kind of somewhat of a mystery why it's mentioned later on. Um, and um, this altar of incense is often looked at and thought that it symbolizes prayer. Um, well, I did that backwards, didn't I? Give me another one there, if you would, please. Another one yet. There it is. There it is. Okay. You know what I did? I copied an old slide that has those bad directions in it. Uh, it most li likely symbolizes prayer. Where is this? Altar of incense, where is it stationed at? Do you know its placement? Elka? Yep. Yeah, when that curtain is moved, that incense would go into the, the holy place. More of that in a moment. Yeah, it says it right there. Look, the last one, placement just outside the veil of the most holy place. Yeah. There, there is also the point that has been made by the commentators that the height is the same as the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and uh, it's fascinating to consider that. Now, one of the things when Moses is told to build the tabernacle and build these furnishings, he's told them to make them just like what? Like he saw where? After the pattern he saw in heaven. All of this stuff is after the pattern that he saw in heaven. And... Um, that's repeated many, many times. Now, I'm, I'm driving home at that because as we look at incense throughout the Word of God, and I'm not going to look at all the scriptures that are there, but as we look at incense and prayer throughout the Word of God, there's many times where it is clearly symbolic. Somebody go to Psalms 141, verse 2. Psalms 141, verse 2. I don't you want you to get to where you never bring your Bible. I know I put the scriptures up here, but you should have your smart device or your Bible with you. Psalms 141, 2. Who has that? And will read it for us, please. Okay, so here's, here's a psalmist saying, you know, my prayer is like incense coming up to you. So... Um, incense and prayer uh, very much looked at as being the same. Now we want to go to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. 
Now, as we read this passage, remember that Moses has built the tabernacle after the pattern that he has seen in heaven. And when you have that in mind, and then read this verse, it's kind of like, oh, okay. So Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. Who has that? And we'll read it for us. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Oh, look at that. Each one had a harp, and they were holding gold bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the people or of the saints. And so... Um, it is most often thought of that incense as being symbolic of, of prayer. And uh, how often was the incense to be offered or burned? Continuously. Yeah, and it was to be replenished morning and evening is when it was to be replenished. Let's take a look at this other slide to see the placement. Elka already talked about it. See my red circle? If you see, I know you in the back. If you would just sit up front, you could see this better. No. So um, that is, again, an artist's rendition of, I should have a laser pointer that I could do this, but an, an artist's rendition of what it might have looked like in the tabernacle with dimensions and all that. You've got a lamp stand on one side, the bread, uh, the table of showbread or, or the table of the bread of presence, it's also called. And then right outside the the veil where the Ark of the Covenant is, in the center there is the altar of incense. That's the placement of this according to the directions that Moses was given. You know, there are other scriptures that associate prayer and incense together. Um, Revelation 8, 3 through 4, another angel came and stood at the altar holding a golden censer and much incense was given to him so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints. And the smoke of incense with the prayers of the saints went up to the Lord. Um, so there, there are other passages that relate all of that. Any thoughts or questions or maybe even observations before we move on from the altar of incense? Uh, you know, the incense is to burn continually. What are prayers? We were, to we were told to pray how much? Without ceasing, you know. Just like incense is offered continuously, we are to pray without ceasing. All right, let's move on. Let's take a look then at the next um, group of scriptures. And this, in chapter 30, this is that section that deals with money for the tabernacle. Somebody be willing to read for us, please, verses 11 through 16. Oh, you know, I had a whole bunch of paper to hand out to you, and I forgot it in my office. It is on a seat, one of those chairs in front of my desk. So um, Exodus 30, 11 through 16. Volunteer? Then no plague will strike the people as you count them. Each person who is counted must give a small piece of silver as a sacred offering to the Lord. This payment is half a shekel based on the sanctuary's shekel, which equals 20 years. All who have reached their 20th birthday must give the sacred offering to the Lord. When, it, when this offering is given to the Lord to purify your lives, making you right with him, the rich must not give more than the, sanct than the specified amount, 
and the poor must not get less. Re receive this ransom money from the Israelites and use it for the care of, tabern of the tabernacle. It will bring the Israelites to the Lord's attention and it will purify your lives. Okay. Um, Nancy and Josh are passing out some of the papers I had prepared for you. Those slides that, you know, in case you wanted to see a little bit closer, the placement of the tabernacle, the incense altar and all that. And as they're passing it out, it strikes me. I always, you know, I think, how many should I make? How many copies should I make? Oh, 20 will be plenty. Tonight, I don't know that 20 is plenty. So anyway, I, I, I apologize. All right. So here, um, this... This is a fast, to me, this is a fascinating passage. It, it's pretty straightforward. God says to Moses, whenever you take a census of the people, um, each man who is counted must pay a ransom for what? Each man must pay, look at verse 12. Each man must pay a ransom for... Himself to who? To who? He's paying a ransom for himself to the Lord. Real important for us to remember that. Was there a time, and we won't answer it just yet, I mean, we won't go into the details. Was there a time that a census was taken and it made God very angry? What's that? Yeah, Sandy, who was it? David. And God was angry because the census was taken. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, Joab was begging David not to take the census. He said, my Lord, don't do this. Perfect count. Okay, good. So, um, but a census was taken, and we'll get into that a little bit more. But here it's pretty straightforward. Um, he's told that everybody that is how old? 20 or older is to be a part of this census, to be counted, and to pay this ransom. So um, each uh, male member of Israel, uh, it was this, I got this all, it's messed up again. So just put them all up there. Okay. <laughs> So Israelites, 20 years and older to pay a ransom, to, and that ransom helped them to what? Avoid death. What happened when David did the census? What happened? People died. There was a plague that took place. Now, the scripture text we just looked at said the ransom was the same for all. Whether they were rich or poor, it was to be the same. You know, the half shekel, a gera, or, or, or whatever that, that uh, happens to be. And then also, we see that the ransom money was for the support of the tabernacle. It was to use for the care. It was, it was the maintenance fund, if you would, please. You know, it was the maintenance fund to take care of the tabernacle, because how many of you know Anything that you have needs maintenance, right? Let me tell on myself real quick. When I moved to Texas in 2004, I thought, a sprinkler system in the yard. It's PVC. It's plastic. It's buried in the ground. It will never need any maintenance. <laughs> At least once a month, I cut one of those heads off with my mower. The grass sticks in them and the springs don't go pull back down. You know, um, they've settled deeper than what they were to begin with. You know, everything needs maintenance. That's my point. Everything needs maintenance. And so God had set up this system for the maintenance of the tabernacle. Some came to call this the sanctuary tax. Um, and, and even later... I believe it was called during the time of Jesus the temple tax that had to be paid. And so 
Um, it provided the upkeep um, for the maintenance of the tabernacle and later the, the temple later on. But a census was considered a dangerous thing. Let's go to the next slide. And, and why do you think a census was a dangerous undertaking? Why do you think it might be so dangerous? And why was God angry at David for taking the census? Okay? You know, he, he was, uh, wasn't trusting God. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. Uh, Nancy. Uh, Nancy. <laughs> Sandy. <laughs> yeah, that was Joab. And, and um, Norm just made the same observation. Okay, so let's look at when census was usually taken. Um, it's a dangerous thing partly because uh, we're right. It was a dangerous thing because partly it was done, usually done in preparation for war or taxation. Neither one of those David was doing. Neither one of those things were involved there. Then the other thing that, I, that I'm thinking about that is usually when you are counting or numbering something, it often has to do with ownership. Do you, um, do you take and check your checking account and see what your balance is and your savings account? Do you make sure, you know, why do you do that? Because you're responsible for that, right? It, it, it's kind of like, and I understand from a spiritual standpoint what I'm about to say you could take umbrage with, but that's your money and you're counting it to make sure it's all there, right? Well, here as we get into this, the next thing I think that is, is really telling in this, and go ahead with the last one, ransom money averted the misunderstanding of ownership. When a census was taken, they paid a ransom, and the ransom reminded them they were not their own. They were God's. And I, I personally feel, I can't prove it, but I personally feel that's one of the reasons why God was angry with David. Look, you aren't, you aren't reminding the people. You're, you're thinking these are your people that are serving you in your kingdom. They're my people, and you have forgotten to make clear to them that they belong to the Lord. Well, it was a horrific plague, and um, the angel was just about even to smite Jerusalem, and um, it was avoided. God said enough. David had repented, and it was at the threshing floor there in Jerusalem where the angel was stopped. So we see that it was originally instituted, this census here for the temple tax, and it was a ransom that averted a misunderstanding of ownership. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments to make in regard to the census and the temple tax? Was it the temple tax that the Pharisees came to Peter and said, you know, you need to pay, you and Jesus? And um, Jesus sent Peter down to the lake to get the fish with the coin in his mouth. Was that the temple tax there too? I, I think it was. All right. Uh, plans for the wash basin. Let's take a look at these scripture now. Um, someone willing to read verses 17 through 21 that's up here on the screen. Elka? Okay, yes. Um, I, it's certainly the same principle. I don't think that's where it came from because... Abraham gave a tithe long before this. Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek, the prince of Salem, after rescuing his, his nephew Lot, and he had all of these spoils. 
and he gave to Abraham. That's the first time the tithe is mentioned, and it predates the law in Abraham giving that. Yes, Rob. Yeah, I mean, certainly, yeah, you know, whether rich or poor, uh, the haves or the have-nots, you know, uh, the forgiveness that comes through Christ is the same. Anybody else? Okay, let's take a look at the wash basin here. Um, have a volunteer to read it. Elka? Okay, thank you. I want to point out that this is a ceremonial washing, but it was to point to the fact that holiness was required of God. Uh, whether they were offering the burnt offering or they were um, going into the tabernacle, uh, anything like that, wherever they would go, they, before the Lord, um, they were to cleanse themselves ceremonially, the washing of their hands and their feet, to show how God expected there to be holiness uh, before him. Um, Let's talk about the wash basin for a moment here. Um, what are the dimensions of this wash basin? There are none given. Yeah, the pictures that make it look really big, except the one I have here and I didn't put up there. Um, Solomon's was huge. The wash basin that Solomon built for the temple, what was it called? It was called the sea. That's how big it was. But he also had 30 carts of smaller basins, water carts as well. Um, we don't have here in Exodus any dimensions given. Um, the only thing that is told to us, and let's see if I have these right. <laughs> It was made from bronze mirrors, okay? It was made from bronze. Where did the bronze mirrors come from? That's right. It was part of the spoils. As the women were leaving Egypt, the Egyptian women uh, gave them their bronze mirrors that they used, and this bronze was then melted, and it was shaped into a basin. Now, because it says basin, we can pretty much deduce that the shape was what? Oval or round. Yeah, you know. Um, but as far as the size in that, we, we don't know. Um, it, um, go ahead. So then finally, uh, I also want to point out to you the main point of this section is, is that the priests were to always uh, wash every time they entered the tent or they performed one of the duties. There was this ritual and ceremonial washing that took place every time that they entered. Um, you know, I think as we relate this to our own lives, anytime we come into the presence of the Lord, I think that we, we need to make sure our hearts are right. We need to wash our, the, heart, the, the hands of our heart and the feet of our heart, right? Um, uh, you know, I don't think it should just be when we take communion. You know, we're supposed to examine ourselves as we celebrate communion. But every time we come into the presence of the Lord, like, like this example is given to us, we, we ought to, you know, examine our own hearts and say, Oh, God, you know, you're reminding me. I, I ask for your, your forgiveness because... The way I spoke to Elka a few minutes ago wasn't the way I should have spoke to Elka a few minutes ago. 
you know? And, and so that whenever we come into his presence, we are uh, coming with the idea of having our heart and our life in the right place. Could could that could that be good for all this year? <laughs> nah, it won't work. It won't work. It won't work. I know it won't work. <laughs> okay. So moving on, let's look at the anointing oil. <laughs> so let's look at the anointing oil. Exodus chapter 30, verses 22 through 28. Someone Read now. now, here we have some specific amounts and directions, whereas it, when we were looking at the, the wash basin or the laver, not a whole lot of description. Someone read for us verses 22 through 28. So, uh, oh, I think we need to go on to another section. Consecrate them to make them absolutely holy after this. Whatever touches them will also become holy. Anoint Aaron and his sons also. Consecrate them to serve me as priests. And say to the people of Israel, this holy anointing oil is reserved for me from generation to generation. It must never be used to anoint anyone else, and you must never make any blend like it for yourselves. It is holy, it, it, and you must treat it as holy. Anyone who makes a blend like it or anoints someone other than a priest will be cut off from the community. Um, so... Let's take a look at a couple of facts about the anointing oil real, real quick. Uh, fact number one, um, it's made from the finest of spices. And these were the very best and high, highest valued spices that were to be used. Fact two, the oil was to be made of flowing myrrh worth about 500 shekels. I have no idea what flowing myrrh is. It's a liquid, but what is is myrrh a spice or is it a sap from a? Where did it come from? From a tree. Okay. All right. Um, it it was very aromatic, apparently. Yeah, I'm looking here. It seeps from the cracks in the bark that typically grows in both. Arabia and India, and um, so um, it's probably a very substantial amount of myrrh. And then fact three, it was to be made of a fragrant cinnamon worth about 250 shekels. And a, a cinnamon, the word cinnamon, only appears, according to this commentator, it only appears three times in the entire Bible, the word cinnamon. Cinnamon, cinnamon smells great, doesn't it? I, I love cinnamon. It's just awesome. Uh, number four, oh, by the way, cinnamon really helps if you've had a lot of sugar. It will help kind of level out your blood sugar. So some other people know that as well. So the next time you go to DQ and you have that peanut butter pus or parfait, make sure you go home and have some cinnamon, you know. Don't mix it with sugar, but... <laughs> Anyway, 
Fact number four, this oil was to be also made of a fragrant cane. And I, I, what I saw was that it became also known as Indian lemongrass, this fragrant cane. And then finally, um, fact number five, we saw this. It's not to be used for personal use. It's holy unto the Lord. It's separated only for God's use is what, what this anointing oil was to be. And any anointing on our lives ought to be for God's use, right? You know, if we've been anointed in one way or another, God expects that gift, that anointing to be used for his purposes and not for personal purposes. Let's move on to the, unless somebody has anything to say or observations uh, on this, we'll move on to the incense. All right, let's move on to Exodus 30, verses 34 through 38. And uh, again, if we could have someone read that for us, please. So both the anointing oil and the incense are holy and to be used only for the Lord. Um, this, there's three times in these verses that this anointing oil is taught, it's stressed that it's holy. And then one point, it's very holy. And um, uh, again, we can see that this is... Um, for God's purposes and, and no other purpose. Um, any thoughts, observations in regard to the incense? All right, let's move on to chapter 31. All right, uh, we're going to look at chapter 31 tonight. It's not a real long chapter, but um, there are two things that are described in this chapter. There are the craftsmen that are talked about in the making of, of everything about the tabernacle, two individuals specifically mentioned, and then there's also the instructions for the Sabbath. So um, someone read for us uh, verses 1 through 6 that describe these craftsmen and talk about them. Elka, can I ask you to read those? Okay. Yeah, you can read from there. Now the Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and skill, in understanding and intelligence, in knowledge and in all kinds of craftsmanship, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for settings, and in the carving of wood to work all kinds of craftsmanship. And behold, I myself have appointed him a holy of, son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, to all who are wise-hearted. I have given the skill and ability to make everything that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting, the ark of the testimony, the mercy seat that is upon it, all the furnishings of the tent, the table for the bread and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils. Next slide. Of incense. The bronze altar is that. Keep going, you're on a roll. The bronze altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, the basin and its base, the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron, the high priest, and the garments for his sons to minister as priests, and the anointing oil and the sweet and fragrant incense for the holy place. They are to make them according to all that I have commanded you. How good were these guys? 
I mean, the, you know, everything is mentioned here. I mean, the garments, the gems, the incense, and, uh, well, well, let's look at how they're gifted. Uh, the next slide. They are uniquely gifted, and not only note they are uniquely gifted, they're chosen of God. God makes it clear, I have chosen them. God set them apart for that, that specific purpose. And it goes on to say even that they're filled with great wisdom. Um, this word isn't used, but the idea is there as well. They have, they have incredible abilities that God has given them. And they, are, they have expertise in all crafts. Did you catch that? Um, that, you know, I have given special skill to all the gifted craftsmen so they can make all the things I have commanded you to make. And so God has given Moses this plan for building the tabernacle and all of that, but he's also provided with the people already how to build it and gifted them. You know, the same is, in, is true as in God's church. You know, I, I just know that we probably have barely tapped the abilities and the talents of the people of abundant life. And, and I'm excited about uh, the years ahead because I believe Pastor Bill is a gifted administrator. And I think he's going to draw that out in people that are here in the congregation plug them in places where their gifts work. And, and we're, we're going to stand back in a year or two and we're going to go, whoa, look what God has done and what God is doing. But see, God had already had in place those people, and I believe that's true for abundant life as well. Any other comments in regard to the craftsman? Well, yeah, I, I think we know that the majority of, certainly there's this gifting that God has given them, he's given these abilities. I tend to also think, though, that in Egypt, there might have been a recognition that, hey, this guy doesn't need to be a bricklayer or, or, or making bricks. He's got... Too much talent and understanding. He needs to be a part of making our jewelry here. Because the Egyptians had jewelry, right? Oh, yes. You know? And so I think that the skills that God had given them were there. They were recognized. And, and some of that was developed and honed and polished, if you will, upon. Polished, if you will, in Egypt in preparation. J just like you and me. You know? There are things that you and I do, and I hate this word secular versus church because it, it all is supposed to be sacred in our lives, all that we do. But work outside some of those same skills that, that we are paid to do come and translate into the church as well. Let me brag on Steve back there, Steve Vasquez. Come on, put your, put your hand up, Steve. So, so Steve comes and volunteers here at the church, and little did I know that he had been doing some janitorial duties at someplace else. And so he shows up here, and it's one or two days, and he starts doing stuff. He just sees it needs to be done. You know, he sees that, you know, this needs to be cleaned. And, and, and you know what I love about Steve? You know, he, he's... He, he sees that the bag, the garbage bag, is half full. And he says, you know, instead of just taking that, I'm going to combine all those others until I have one bag and I'm not throwing away six. So my point is this. And come on, give Steve a hand. I, I appreciate Steve. My point is this, that, you know, there's, there's these skills and things that we've learned outside the church that God has prepared us to, to bless his people with and his church with. And, and I think that that's so important for us to see and understand. And I think some of that may have happened with this, but it was obvious that these men were chosen and anointed with God and their gifting came from God. Amen. 
All right, let's take a look at the instructions for the Sabbath, the last part of this chapter. Someone read for us, please, verses 12 through 15. Okay, verses 16 through 18, the last part of the, of the chapter. The people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. This is a covenant obligation for all time. It is a permanent sign of my covenant. Catch this. A permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he stopped working and was refreshed. Then the Lord, when the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. So uh, this is about instructions for the Sabbath. And um, I want you to note, if we go to the next slide, that it was uniquely given. Hey, they all appeared at once. That's awesome. <laughs> it was uniquely given to Moses for who? For Israel. H how many of you, um, you know, you don't turn on a light switch and you don't do any kind of work at all on a Sabbath? No, I mean... My, my point to us is this. It was a sign of a covenant with Israel, the Sabbath. And this scripture makes it very clear. And then we come along to Jesus when he comes in, in, in the New Testament. And one of the reasons why the Pharisees were so angry with Jesus was what? He's working on this. He's healing people on the Sabbath. You know, he's all kinds of things that he's doing on the Sabbath, you know. And Jesus tells them what? Yeah, he says, you know, is it, is it, is it a sin to do good on the Sabbath? And he points out indiscrepancies. Uh, Esther said that he, he points out to them the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Man isn't to serve the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is to serve man. But Jesus also said he was Lord of the Sabbath. What does it mean if you're Lord of something? I call the shots, you know. I'm the one to, to say, you know. And, and we know then that Jesus completed the law, and it was nailed to the cross according to Colossians 2, 10 through 16. And we come to Colossians 2, 16. It says, let no one judge you with regard to a religious festival, a new moon, or celebration of a Sabbath day. And Paul was a big, big proponent of making sure that we didn't come back and put ourselves under the law. And so um, there we finish up chapter uh, 31. Any questions or observations in regard to the Sabbath and instructions for the Sabbath? I, I do just want to add a caveat in that. I think a principle of Sabbath is a very good thing for us to practice. You know, um, I don't think we need to be bound by uh, the burden of being legalistic in that. But I think uh, having a Sabbath principle is a very good thing for us. It helps us physically. It helps us mentally. And, and you know, Chick-fil-A hasn't suffered very much at all, have they? How many of you have tried to go to Chick-fil-A on Sunday? <laughs> well, let's just go to Chick-fil-A. Oh, it's Sunday, you know. Yeah. yeah. 
Father, thank you for your word tonight. We, we give you praise and thanks, Lord, for all that you are and done, and Lord, for the beauty of your word. Thank you, Jesus. We pray now, Lord, for our time of prayer that uh, as we enter into it, it would be powerful and effectual for those who are depending upon our interceding for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Pastor Josh, would you help me in closing with uh, these prayer requests? Sir, <laughs> he was ready for me. You know, the, the concept of the Sabbath is something that's, it's kind of hotly debated in some churches, right? So what day is the Sabbath? I heard, I heard, I heard a mix, I heard a mix answers. Sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. That's correct. And the Lord and why is and why is the Lord's Day Sunday? Because because he, he rose he rose from the grave. So so pastors' teaching on the concept of a Sabbath, oftentimes the church takes Sunday as the concept of a Sabbath and the celebrating of the Lord's Day, but it's not technically the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday, right? I'm curious, does anybody in here observe in, in effort, not necessarily by chance, Saturday and Sunday? Yeah. I, you used to do both? Just because of my nanny. Yeah. She was, she was a Sabbath school, so from Friday night, so I had to go to her church on Saturday and then go to my church on Sunday. Well, I mean, church isn't necessarily the practice of Sabbath. Right. That's just the day we celebrate. You know, that's what we, we go to, to worship the Lord, right? I, I got to say, the Sabbath is one of the things I have to focus on. Like, I have to intentionally try and not work, which is not an easy thing. I do. I do. I, it's, it, but, but, like, there's a difference in, like, your work work and then, like, mowing the lawn. I don't have one. But if I did, I would hope my kids would mow it. Anyway. We could probably talk all night about yeah, this, because this is something that people talk about all. You know, I, I like that we can chat about it and it not be something that we get worked up over because we're probably going to have some disagreements on things like what time of day you should mow or if which child you should force to mow, what age you should start forcing them or whether you should mow at all, right? What if it was lemongrass, you know? Um, and with that, a couple of prayer requests. Um, Rachel Herrera has COVID, um, nightmares, and sleep paralysis. Wow. Um, this, that's scary. We haven't seen Rachel in some time. Where sh where, is she out of, out of town now, right? Korea. Yeah. Well, that's, that's scary. Um, and then, of course, we're going to continue praying for uh, the... Really? Man, time flies. But she's dealing with, with paralysis and, or sleep paralysis. And that's scary. Um, and then, of course, we continue to pray for Joe and Dora. Um, if you're able to be here this uh, Saturday, the, the, the funeral's at what time, Pastor? 11 o'clock. I'm sure that it would, it would mean, be meaningful for them. Um, also, a couple of prayer requests for the Arisolas, um, that their parents' home will sell. Um, so pray for just favor in this market. We can see that answer answered prayer relatively quickly, I hope. And then uh, Larry Ingram 
um, which is one of the friends of the air soul is uh, hip replacement and therapy. And then of course we want to continue praying for pastor, uh, pastor Baker, uh, Bill and Jenny. Um, they're trying to, you know, they I think their house goes up for sale. It, it might've gone up today. Um, and then uh, they, you know, they got to get another one. So I, I can just imagine it's kind of a hectic time for them. They, um, I, I think, and you got to know, I volunteered you. I didn't say voluntold, I volunteered. So he calls uh, and he, he mentioned, he was hesitant to call me. He's always afraid to call me because he's worried that, you know, he's inconveniencing. It's like, pastor, don't, don't, don't look at it like that. Um, but they're going to be, he's going to be, I think, traveling to town to look at houses again. Uh, I think it's like a, a fly in, fly out, same day, either Friday or Saturday or something like that. And he asked me, he was calling to ask, would there be any way I, you know, I could pick him up from the airport. Uh, you know, he could drive around with the realtor, no problem. He was asking something like that. And I'm like, like the fact that you hesitated, we, we haven't communicated clearly enough. We're here to serve you. And I told him, I said, Pastor Bill, I can assure you there is an entire congregation just looking for opportunity to serve you. So if you're coming to town, whether Nancy or I or, or somebody that's on staff can pick you up and drop you off at the airport or not, I guarantee there's somebody in the church that would be more than happy um, to, to pick you up, drop you off. And I wouldn't even be surprised if somebody had a vehicle that you could borrow. I mean, I just, I know that there's enough people in the congregation. So we just want to pray for them as they go through this transition time. There's a lot of moving parts and continue to just pray for it to be a smooth transition for them. With that, by the way, I also want to pray for uh, this weekend. So on Sunday, we all know it's Father's Day. We're going to be having, you know, some of those uh, competition things again. You know, fathers kind of competing. So you might want to start doing your push-ups now. It's not going to do you a lot of good between now and Sunday, but you should probably try. Start, start doing those push-ups now. Um, so just, just pray because, you know, I don't do well with, with losing competitions. <laughs> and, and Pastor Sam doesn't either. And so just pray for us. That's, that's all I'll say. Other prayer requests, maybe of a more serious nature. Yeah. Mm. Mm. What's, what's, what's her name? What is, what is his and her name? You know his name? Brandon, okay. Yes. Are they are they married or okay? Yeah. We'll pray for him. We like praise reports. Excellent. That's a praise report. Two praise reports. What else we got? Yep. This is not really a praise report. I thought it was cool. I was watering a French flower chest and her water has no room. And my little granddaughter is five. She has an angel, she has an angel out in front. And my little granddaughter and I were watering her flower chest one day. And she said, Man, where'd the angel go? I said, You mean the statue? She said, No, there was an angel standing right here. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Praise the Lord. 
That's cool. Other prayer requests? Yeah. Rob. Praise the Lord. Congratulations. That's great. That's great. I've always appreciated how well you share your faith and invite people. That's an encouragement. So we do want to pray for the, the young people. They're going to be going to camp this next week. And so pray that my kids get saved. <laughs> so, so Isaac is saved apparently, but I guess we pray for the others. <laughs> Well, let's, let's, uh, yes, Karen. Um, almost two years ago, my mom was diagnosed with stage four cancer, and she is still doing, we have her up there, you know, good days and bad, but thank God that the final drug, the chemo didn't work, so now they're trying her new drug, and the tumors are not growing, it's not spreading, and she was able to have... I today. Yeah. It's so it's stressful because I'm hearing everything from here. Yeah. But you know, God's keeping me, keeping her. It's peace of mind and everything, so I thank him for that. That's excellent. So we have several things to give thanks for tonight, and I don't want that to go unnoticed. So let's pray um and just give thanks to God because He's faithful and always answering prayers like this. So, Lord, we just begin by saying, thank you, God. We praise you, Lord. We exalt your name. We honor you, Lord. Lord, we, we thank you that you are so good, that you're so faithful, Lord, in season, out of season, Lord, that you're the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and that we see that that goodness, Lord, that we can rest in, that we can put our faith in, that we can be encouraged by, that we, we hear these reports, Lord, of your goodness, and it encourages us as we go through different things in our own lives, God. We thank you for who you are and for what you continue to do in our lives, Lord. It's encouraging, and we, we just give you thanks and, and glory to your name, Lord. We, we specifically, Lord, we want to give thanks for Esther's nephew, God, that, that the heart surgery has, has not, only, not only happened, Lord, but that the, the recovery has gone so well that he's able to get back to work, able to begin getting back to life as normal. For her grandson who was in a car accident, Lord, that, that there's nothing more that needs to be done, but he can just recover and be in peace, Lord, with the recovery process, God. Lord, we thank you. And, and just the encouragement that comes from Sandy's uh, granddaughter, Lord, something as small as her seeing an angel. God, it's just, it's an encouragement. And I pray that each and every one of us in here can, can have that same faith of a child that we can know and remember that you're present always, that your, your, your angels and the spiritual realm is at work in constant time, Lord, around us and in our lives, Lord, that we can just be reminded of your presence, Lord. God, we give you thanks for, for this this child that's been brought into this earth, Lord, that we can just give glory to your name for a healthy pregnancy, a healthy birth, that the report from the, the, the Christmas time had no bearing, Lord, but there's a healthy baby that's, that we can give thanks to you for, Lord. And we pray in, in light of that, we pray that 
that Rick and Linda's uh, grandson, Lord, can, can, they can turn the tables, Lord, that the change in mind, change in heart will take place, that they can recognize and understand the blessing of child, the blessing that this baby can be in their lives, that they can remember and understand that this is a gift from you, and that they can let this child come to fur, full fruition, be birth, Lord, and let that your, your hand will be upon that child's life throughout the entirety, that great things will happen through this child's life. Lord, we just pray in faith that you'll change her heart. Change her heart, Lord. Give, give wisdom and guidance to those who are around her that can encourage her towards life, towards choosing life, God. Lord, I pray that you'll draw Brandon and his girlfriend to you that you can help them to have a real relationship with you, an experience that touches their hearts forever, that turns them from, from the place where they're at into, into people who are, are spreading light and, and imparting your, your kingdom into others, Lord. God, we give you thanks for, uh, for Karen's praise report of her mom. Lord, when we go through these things, when we see in the midst of the difficulty of cancer and even something as, as severe as stage four cancer, it can seem hopeless at times. And so we give thanks when someone has overcome this type of a cancer. Lord, we give thanks for the wisdom and guidance in the chemotherapy and the doctors, Lord, that, that helped in this process of healing. Let this be an encouragement. Lord, we pray right now for Rachel Herrera, who's struggling with COVID, that you'll heal her body, touch her, Lord, mightily right now. Lord, help her to come home safely and soon so that she can start her new life back in the States, Lord. And you'll just bless her physically right now in her body. Just touch her body, heal her. Lord, we, we ask that you'll help with uh, uh, the aerosolas, Lord, that they're the mother or their fathers, the parents' uh, home will sell quickly and at, at a good price, Lord, that you can just bless them with that praise report. And Lord, we pray for Larry Ingram that you could just help the hip replacement to go smoothly, that the surgery will go well and there will be a quick and timely uh, recovery, that the therapy will work, Lord, and that he'll walk in encouragement. We pray for comfort right now. Pray for comfort for Joe and Dora as they... As they go through this season of grief, Lord, help us as a church body to know how to be there for them. Help us as a church body to love them, to care for them. And we just pray that your Holy Spirit will, will be the comforter that we know you to be. Just be a comforter in their life right now. God, we pray for our youth as they uh, continue to go after you. Lord, I pray that right now you'll just begin working in the hearts and minds of those who are going to be going to youth camp this next week. Lord, that you'll just stir something within them, that you'll give a wisdom and a guidance. Do the same in your youth leaders, Lord, that Pastor Sam will have supernatural guidance on how to, how to minister to these young people, how to foster their relationship with you, Lord. And God, we pray for Pastor Bill and Jenny. Help them in this process. Give them wisdom, give them guidance, give them favor, help their home to sell quickly at top dollar, and help them to find a, a good home that's the right home for them here in the, the Metroplex. Guide and direct them, Lord. Lord, we pray for our, our children's ministry as well as they can continue to be ministered to by, by Pastor Sharon. Ask that you'll work through our children's ministry as they gear up for VBS. And Lord, we just ask that you'll be glorified by the lives of each and every one of us here this evening, that we can honor you in everything that we do. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Well, thank you. And um, as always, there's an offering bag right here on the corner. You can, of course, give online or through text or through the app. And if you need help with that, 